Hello, my name is Hillary. I am a graduate student through Miami University, Project Dragonfly, and Denver Zoo. Before pursuing this master's degree, I had basically no formal training in biology or zoology or any hard science at all. I majored in creative writing, and I do a lot of drawing and painting and visual arts. So doing art at zoos and aquariums and museums is one of my favorite things to do. Basically, the whole reason I started looking into biology graduate programs was to find something vaguely related to that activity and the two disparate parts involved. Yeah. You're so pretty. <laughs> I was originally looking for something like scientific illustration, which is really cool and still something I'd like to take a class in sometime. But detailed realism isn't really my natural forte, and neither are the hard sciences. I've tried. But a big part of art, especially in relation to science, is communication. Visual arts at their heart are about creating a representation of something, a physical thing in real life, an idea or concept or moral, and putting that representation forward to an audience in order to engage with the thing it's representing. And that's what I'm most interested in, as it turns out. Doing life drawings at the zoo is a hobby I picked up. I don't really know how or when, actually. But it's something I started doing entirely for myself, because I like animals and I like drawing, so why not combine the two with a little more intention? I think I started doing it in earnest at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, because it was reasonably close to where I lived, and at some point I got a membership so I could skip the whole line to get in and not have to pay every time. At this point, I draw and paint at pretty much every new zoo or aquarium I go to. I take reference photos, I always have at least one sketchbook with me, and pens and watercolors, <laughs> and I will crouch awkwardly in front of exhibits for like an hour at a time sometimes. It's my favorite way to engage. It's... it's life drawing. Drawing from life is pretty widely accepted as one of the things you have to do to improve your art. Like most art things, it's subjective, but it's advice you're going to get from pretty much any professional artist you ask. It's also something that for a long time I absolutely hated because I was bad at it. I don't usually have the patience or attention span or steady hands to do perspective properly, so my landscapes and buildings in particular always look way off to me. Part of that is the natural artist instinct to criticize yourself too harshly, but part of it is also that it is a weakness of mine. Figure drawing was a little bit better, but suffered from similar issues with my inability to get the proportions and foreshortening right, no matter how many helpful tips I used. And to add to that, figure drawing sessions are almost always in a quiet, private rooms, and everyone is hushed and you feel like a horrible person when you drop a pencil or something and it sounds so loud. Or maybe that's just me. Headphones help a little bit. Either way, as much as it is a pain, it really does help to take reference from real life in a physical space. It's not going to be perfect, you're going to move and lose the angle you are at, the light will change, you're going to realize you didn't leave enough room on the paper and get mad that you've somehow only used the bottom third of it, but you learn to adapt to that, and it all adds up to improvement. Drawing from photos is also super helpful and supplements what you learn drawing in real life. But when you're drawing animals, they don't understand that you want them to hold still for a bit so you can get the details down. They're going to be moving around, even if they're asleep. You have to learn to deal with and account for that. So, what's all this got to do with science? The big thing that visual arts and science have in common is this. So much of both art and science is just observing the subject. In art, it's mostly visual, obviously, but by the nature of being in the same physical space, you're also going to hear and maybe smell the subject. You may or may not be able to touch the subject, admittedly pretty unlikely at a zoo, but you're still feeling the temperature of the space, the dust in the air, the vibrations of sound in the ground. And you're making those observations and taking notice, and while it may not be as intentional as a thorough scientific observation, those factors are going to affect your experience and, as a result, the final project. Hopefully, you aren't usually tasting your subject. 
maybe if it's a fruit still life or something. But yeah, observation. If you're drawing from life, you're spending a long time staring at your subject. And I'm not saying that as an artist you're required to do the same detailed record keeping and measuring that someone doing a scientific study would. You don't have to read peer review papers and studies before you go to get a full background check just to hang out on a bench and draw a giraffe. But here's my first piece of advice in that communication thing I was talking about. Look at the plaques. Find out what the animal you're drawing even is. How do you pronounce their name? Don't assume a crocodile is an alligator. Did you think that was a weird zebra over there? No! no. It's an okapi. That's a part of the observation. It's gathering information instead of acting on assumption. If nothing else, you can accurately tell people what it is you have drawn. Also, a lot of zoos, etc., will have some kind of fun facts written nearby. Look at those. Oh, but I'm not here to learn about science. I'm trying to improve my art. Listen, it's the same thing. Or at least there's a lot of overlap. Here's an example. Let's say there's a sign by the rhinoceros that says what's up with rhinoceros feet. Many people aren't going to look at a rhinoceros and think that it's walking on its toes. From far away, a rhino's foot looks basically like a big flat circle. And if you're drawing a rhino, even drawing from a subject right in front of you, you're likely to default to something you're more familiar with. You'll give it human-like limbs, or maybe something akin to your dog or cat. And because of that, it's going to look just a little bit off and you won't even know why. Once you do know why, once you know that anatomy, you're going to draw your rhinos that much better. Then, when you're back to drawing, think about the details that you're working on. Why is it shaped like that? Why is it that color? What's that bump on its forehead? Why is it doing that specific behavior? What I encourage other artists to do is to not only ask these questions, but to act on them. This is basically the scientific method of inquiry. Inquiry refers to the work scientists do when they study the natural world, proposing explanations that include evidence gathered from the world around them. It also includes activities such as posing questions, planning investigations, and reviewing what is already known in light of experimental evidence. In other words, the basic steps are to observe a subject in detail and see what questions pop up naturally. Then, and here's the part where people tend to drop off, try to answer those questions. Make a guess for yourself based on what you know from other animals, school, personal experience. Ask yourself why you think that and follow the reasoning. Then seek out the true answer. You've probably got a smartphone, pull it out and Google it. Or if you're at the zoo, ask a zookeeper or volunteer. They're almost always happy to engage. Bottom line, don't let those questions stay a mystery forever. There's probably some kind of answer out there. And if not, maybe you want to be the one to find it. Keep observing. Look at your subject and do quick sketches or in-depth illustrations. Either way, you're going to be standing still for a bit. And a thing I've noticed when you're hanging out for a long time with a sketchbook and your art supplies and a partly finished piece of work, no matter how out of the way you try and keep yourself jammed in a corner, sitting on the floor, ducking your head so you don't block the view, you're going to get an audience. It almost always starts with kids standing silently over your shoulder watching you watch the animals. For whatever reason, I found that most of them aren't going to say much. There's some kind of ingrained instinct not to distract you with talking. They just want to watch. It can be a bit unnerving and uncomfortable, but that's just how kids are sometimes. It's more likely to be adults who start talking and asking questions. Kids might just say, I like your picture, and that's about it. Grown-ups will start a whole conversation, especially if they have kids with them and want to encourage their interest. The reason I want to emphasize how the other guests are going to interact with you is that communication by way of guest experience is absolutely vital in conservation. Knowledge and understanding of biology and conservation issues have shown to improve with visits to zoos and aquariums, especially when exposed for longer periods of time, with repeat visits, and with participatory activities. Visual arts have likewise been shown to improve retention and understanding, as well as increased pro-environmental behavior, 
There is less research available on non-academic effects, partly due to things like perceptions and emotions being less quantifiable than grades or quizzes, but anecdotally, I'll say it worked wonders on me. Nonetheless, casual science that zoos and the like provide is a kind of education, and a way to foster interest in a large audience, rather than providing dense, in-depth information to a smaller one. Not everybody has to be an expert in the scientific side of conservation to be able to make a difference. Encouraging others to make small changes, to learn something they didn't know before, and to love and take action to improve whatever they can in small ways, it all adds up. It's sharing that love and making the experience a good one for everyone involved. Talking with kids who stand over my shoulder as I sit on the floor painting jellyfish is what made me realize I wanted to get more involved in conservation communication. It's working food service in the zoo cafes, then rushing off during the lunch break to sketch the animals. It's learning about animals that I like anyway, and gaining a new appreciation for them, and wanting to conserve the world they live in, and finding ways to help in my everyday life. So here are some things you can do. Don't be a passive observer. Engage with both your subject and your audience. Look for answers. Practice inquiry in your everyday life. Don't let your questions go unanswered. There is something you can learn. Then share those discoveries with other people. If you are going to do art at zoos, or just visit them in general, be sure to look for responsible institutions. All zoos and aquariums accredited by the AZA, WAZA, and EAZA have strict guidelines to adhere to, both in terms of animal welfare and species conservation. If you are an artist, I urge you to look for sustainable art supplies, and please recycle the inevitable paper waste. I've provided some resources for ecologically sound and sustainable art practices in the description. And lastly, look for ways you can help. Many zoos and the like offer citizen science opportunities, which are great ways to hone your observation skills, learn new things, and make a direct difference in something important to you by helping researchers in their studies. I've dropped some resources in the description, which allow you to search by subject, location, online only, and all kinds of other filters. But there are often plenty of opportunities in local schools or communities. Get out there and see what there is to see!